Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. In our last episode we saw the Beatles on their separate journeys when they had their time off. So John went to make a movie and Paul got his house set up and then took a vacation. And George went to India with Patty to learn the sitar and Indian meditation and its history. Ringo was left hanging out and pondering his future if the Beatles did break up. So he was considering acting and also opening up a barbershop. This is going to be the last episode of The Beatles 66 because we have come to the last chapters of the book. But it's been quite an adventure, so let's see how the book ends the story of our favorite band, The Beatles. So George Martin was still talking to John about Strawberry Fields Forever. John said he liked the introduction of the early abandoned version, but the rest of the later version, so he wondered if the best parts could be put together. Martin said it was technically possible, but they were in different tempos and keys, so it couldn't be a seamless transition. He said the results would be jarring, so John told George Martin, well, you can fix that. So this was the Beatles' new way of thinking. They thought if they could imagine a sound, they assumed it could be realized. They lacked academic knowledge about music, and they had an ignorance of many of the technical details of recording. That meant their imaginations were unbounded. So George Martin, he was a perfect match for the Beatles. He had classical training as a musician, 16 years of work in the studio, and production experience with a wide variety of acts from choral to jazz to electronic and skiffle, and he did well when challenged. The producers for the Birds, Stones, and Kinks were usually 27 years old and had about three years of studio experience. It seems like John's song Strawberry Fields inspired Paul to write Penny Lane about another local Liverpool landmark. The two songs were very different. A John song was symbolic and descriptive, and Paul's was honoring the place and had a lot of details. John and Paul had been thinking about writing Liverpool songs since February 1964. John told Rave Magazine that he and Paul wanted to write a stage musical. It was a must, and maybe about Liverpool. And I think that would have been a neat idea. <laughs> In 1965, Paul told a teenage magazine called Flip that I liked some of the things the animals try to do, like the song Eric Burden wrote about the places in Newcastle on the flip side of one of their hits. Paul said he wanted to write about the places in Liverpool where he was brought up. He mentioned Docker's Umbrella, which was a long tunnel through which the Dockers go to work on the Mersey side, and Penny Lane near his old home. The song Paul was talking about that the animals did was called Club A Go Go. It was the B-side of Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. It caught Paul's attention because it was a British group singing about their own hometown instead of Memphis, Chicago, or Route 66. Other British bands and singers were doing the same thing. Donovan sung about Cromwell Road, Good Street, and Portobello Road, the Kings had Regent Street and Leicester Square, and the Stones did Knightsbridge and St. John's Wood. So Paul's song took an ordinary suburban scene and made it enchanting. He looked at it with the childlike eyes, the blue skies, the clean fire engine, the pretty nurse selling poppies, and the clients in the barbershop. John's song wanted you to be in a dream state, and Penny Lane wanted to give you an aerial view of life in the city and the instruments were used to uplift. Those two songs weren't about love, nor could they be played on stage in a concert. Both songs took days to record between them, and they drew inspiration from Indian ragas, Western classical, folk, orchestral, pop, rock and roll, doo-wop, and electronic music. Besides the Beatles instruments, they had 16 additional instruments that were used, and 18 session musicians were hired. When the Beatles first started out, they spent less than 10 hours on their debut album. They spent 60 hours on Help, under 89 hours on Rubber Soul, and then they spent a whopping 225 hours on Revolver. In the early days, they kept strictly to the morning, afternoon, and evening shifts with breaks for refreshments. This was customary for EMI. But on Revolver, they worked until they got the job done. George said, time didn't matter to us. We had a lot to sort out, and we made up a lot as we went along. Revolver was their first album that was to be recorded as a piece of art, rather than what could be delivered on stage. Nowadays, with the advances of technology and the accessibility of using session players on stage, it's become possible to play complex songs in concert. Revolver, with the sampling and the tape manipulation, had a profound effect on everyone from Jimi Hendrix to Jay-Z. 
The engineer for the Beatles, Jeff Emmerich, said, I know for a fact that from the day it came out, Revolver changed the way everyone else made records. The Beatles went from writing songs about boy-girl relationships, dancing, driving, and listening to music. On Revolver, there was 14 songs, but they weren't all about love. The only uh, songs that were love songs were George's I Want to Tell You and Love You Too and Paul's For No One, Good Day Sunshine, and Here, There, and Everywhere. The book stated that it was easy to forget that in 1966, when the Beatles were in their mid-twenties, they were considered old to be pop stars. When they and others said they wouldn't be prancing around the stage at 30, they meant it. And the Beatles' achievements, according to the book Beatles 66, The Revolutionary Year, it was due to their natural talent. Without it, none of the rest would have taken place. The Beatles were creators of memorable pop songs. They couldn't read music, and they had only a basic knowledge of what they were doing, but they composed music that sounded familiar, and they took the listener somewhere unexpected. They resisted predictability, and their songs had something unusual in them that made you want to listen again. They had a strong work ethic and a basic creative talent. They came up with fresh and original material, and it didn't sound like cookie-cutter pop songs. Paul said he wanted to take the fan along with them to stretch the limits of pop. After recording Help in 1965, they were at the top of their game as performers and songwriters, and they could have just repeated themselves. The musicians they looked up to, like Jerry Lee Lewis, the Everly Brothers, Gene Vincent, Chuck Berry, Carl Perkins, Little Richard, and Bo Diddley, they had either stuck to the formula that made them famous, or they went back to roots music that had existed before rock and roll. They didn't attempt to invent music of the future. So the Beatles had a different ambitions because of their art education. It enlarged their frame of reference, and they felt they were entertainers, but they also felt like painters, sculptors, filmmakers, poets, novelists, and dramatists. Drugs also had them seeing things differently, marijuana and LSD. Marijuana allowed their thoughts to flow more freely, LSD did the same thing to them. Revolver opened the door to psychedelic rock, where that sound was trying to create an LSD session without the use of drugs. The Beatles were the first to see the future, and John Lennon said they were in the crow's nest and were able to see land before anyone else. George Martin had no part in the drug aspect of their lives. They didn't talk to him about LSD, and they hid their pot smoking from him. Their weirdness depended on his sobriety in order to get things done, provide perspective, and act as a link to the straight world. George Martin said the greatest dreamers, if they're left to dream, just dream. The great thing about the Beatles is that they were great dreamers who were actually able to get organized. George Martin said he always disapproved of drugs. He didn't believe the drugs made the Beatles any better than they would have been anyway. It was asked if John would have written Strawberry Fields Forever without drugs, and George Martin said, I think John had the creative ability to do an enormous amount, and I think he could have done it without drugs. They also achieved so much in that year of 1966 because they had great competition. There was the Beach Boys, the Who, the Kinks, the Stones, the Birds, the Animals, the Miracles, Donovan, the Supremes, Booker T and the MGs, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, and Bob Dylan. All these people made them raise their game. And the Beatles also came from interesting times. If they lived in a calming time, they might not have reached the heights of creativity. We've reached the end of the book, Beatles 66, The Revolutionary Year. In this episode, we explore what led the Beatles to write songs about their city, Liverpool, how they wanted to expand their artistic music endeavors, and to take the fans with them. How they were up against some steep competition in that year with all kinds of talented singers and bands, so they had to stay on top of their game and go beyond it. And they did. The book detailed the year when the Beatles finally had time to themselves to do things as an individual. It made them more creative, and they still felt at that time that they were going to be Beatles because they all had different interests that they could bounce their ideas off on each other. It took a few more years before they finally decided they had enough of being in a group. But I hope you liked the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated, and it would help my channel out. And I hope everybody's been having a good day. And tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.